Yeah, yeah, uh, Rick Glassman. Scoot doo. Blabbity blue. Scoot dee. Oh, yeah. Hey, man. Hey, man. Nice to meet you. Great to see you. Yeah. It's, it's uh, good, good to be. Am I, am I, am I giving off a. Um, I don't want to be giving off a. I don't want to take this the wrong way. I'm not giving off a weird vibe. But are you distracted? You need to do something? You need to do My something? phone is ringing, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Go get it. Manscape.com. We have all your manly needs. If you don't feel like grooming, it's fine, but people want you to groom. Okay, guys? I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's on the, the product. If you're on the Patreon, you won't see this. All right? I All think right. this one is going to be more do uh, essential designs. Essential designs. Yeah, they do like um, custom apps or software. Yeah. Like, do you have an idea for an app? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, if, if anyone needs a guardian, it matches like younger people that need a guardian. So if you're like 16 and you want someone to drive with you, it matches you with a lot of older men. Yeah, that's not what I meant. Okay. How are our levels? I'm too loud. You feel loud? Let me hear you. How do you feel? <laughs> um, who are you supposed to be? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Del Taco commercial. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, you're the Del Taco commercial. Yeah, the Del Taco commercial, where they got two of me. Oh, El Pollo Loco. El Pollo Loco. Yeah, we can't say that on here because uh, we'll it. Manscaped doesn't... They don't play nice. Well, uh, we'll cut to a clip. Citrus mango? Mm hmm Fire grilled chicken with fresh mango salsa. Obviously. Avocado bacon? Yeah. Hand sliced avocado and crispy bacon. I feel like I don't even know you anymore. Introducing El Pollo Loco's new chicken tostada salads. Featuring citrus mango and avocado bacon. El Boyo Loco. Crazy. You can taste. And we're back. Funny stuff. So, um, I understand you just got out of the hospital. Yeah, it was a pretty serious uh, offense because they're really low on PPE, so they were keeping me there. On PPE? PPE, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have the little jars that they leave in the bathroom because those are open for everyone. And um, I was taking those, so they were kind of holding me at the hospital to be like, hey, you know, we don't know how this works, but we'll get the cops in here because we don't know what an offense is to steal the pee-pee. And uh, would you like a little pee-pee? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Well, top me up. <clears throat> it's not my brand. What kind of pee-pee do you like? Uh, vitamins. Someone who's taken a lot of vitamins. Now, have you tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I take my vitamin C. Yeah. Do you have the little pouch of your scam juice? Well, I can't call it scam juice because the no, only. No, no, no. There, it's, it's a thing. I think it's a placebo. I take vitamins just yeah, like yeah, you. Yeah, but you probably just take your regular vitamin C, so you end up pissing it out, and that's why you like yeah. the taste of that. Oh, yeah. And it has a smell. I don't have a window in my bathroom. Well, the problem is you're just taking it, and it's not absorbing into your body. You need liposomic vitamin C. At your Zuki, okay. not only do you get the pouches, you know, and then the your Zuki commercial I would do, but I'm not going to really I, do it now. Not right now. I don't, I'm good. Fine. All right, fine. It's like a raccoon. You feed it, and then it wants to come back, or it feeds you. It, it it's a mascot, not a raccoon. I know. I'm just saying it's like a raccoon, and that they mate for life. Okay. I am so hot wearing this flannel to match yours. I don't know how you're doing. That fan you could turn toward you. This is a fan? Yeah. Ooh, classy. Okay. Um, I'm fine. I'm, I'm so hot that it hasn't even registered what is making me hot. Right. You know? It's just like I, the whole thing is hot. And, and you know, paper doesn't, doesn't um, breathe. Moses, well, thanks for coming over for the special Halloween episode. Uh, I thought this was going to be the Halloween episode, but I realized I made a mistake, and this isn't the Halloween episode, so I am sorry for all the trouble you went through. Yeah, no, it's totally fine. I have a commercial audition after this. What's it for? 
It's for new Sprite. It's hotter and flatter. <laughs> it's it's called new Sprite. Yeah, yeah. And then here's the copy. Here's the copy right here. Not what I thought. It's good. Yeah. I feel like that's something they could just. They don't need to bring you in for. Do you think like improv is disrespectful in a commercial audition? Like I think you're it's necessary. Taking away from right because you have to stand out because they're seeing the same thing over and over again. Do you still go out for a lot of commercial auditions? Uh, I have not. I've actively turned stuff down. But then since the lockdown, I have all this free time. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it'd be nice to have some money and uh, I would fix some things right now. The uh, I wouldn't mind going into just for a little bit of what the the hell of the process of commercial auditions. Yeah. Well, it's a unique hell right now because uh, from friends that do a lot of commercial auditions, one, it's already very dehumanizing in that you, there's no like actor choice. You're just like a, a mannequin, essentially. What do you mean there's no words. actor choice? Uh, like if you're doing a theatrical thing, it's someone that is an auteur that maybe cares about it on the off chance that you get that. Uh, but commercial auditions, no one, that's no one's dream job. No one that's making commercials. But how is that different in quarantine now than how it was? Oh, so now in quarantine, it was already bad enough. You'd have to drive all the way. But now in quarantine, you have to do everything yourself. And they're not only yeah. casting you, they're casting your place. Right. So they're casting your design and furniture. So you have to set everything up. You have to give them a tour of your apartment. You have to have a friend that, I guess, has to join SAG. Or be sub part of this commercial. I've done a, I've done a, a two auditions. I've st I'm not I'm not against them. I probably would do them again. Yeah. But after two, I, I kind of stopped for a little bit. I didn't get as far as needing to show the tour of the house. It was just on my webcam for the audition. You had to give tours for audition. I didn't I didn't do anything yet. I'm just thinking now of like oh maybe I should do some commercials just because I have time. Right. But before I was like I, if I don't absolutely have to and there's no shade to anyone that is actively going out to commercial auditions. Nothing to it, but if you don't have to, it's better for your soul to not. Do me a favor, bring this closer to you, and then have it away from you, and turning at an angle. You want a little? Yeah, you little could. I'm sorry. Yeah, like that. No, never mind. Put it back to how it was. Okay. No, I'm like, it was just trying to not have it facing the street as much. Yeah. Well, I have a word calendar, and it's just the letter P, so I have to pop it today. Whatever, dude. You want to make this a productive day or not? Bring it to you and have it go like this, so it's up more, so it's not facing the street as much. Oh, like this. <laughs> you were getting the fastest street in the valley. It's so is behind us. When I started doing this balcony series, nobody was leaving the house. Yeah. So there was like no cars outside, and then I thought solved it, <laughs> you know. And and yeah. And then over you know a month it was just great, and then a couple of cars, and now it's gotten to a point where it is what it is. So I, you know, it is what it is. But every now and then I get some comments that are like. What the fuck are you doing? Bring them in the house. Yeah. Like, don't listen then, you... <laughs> can, I say, can I say don't listen then? Uh, yeah, we'll bleep it later. It's all right. All right, well, uh, don't listen then. that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bleep that later. Tom? I like the sound of the outside because you are outside. It makes it feel real. It's just that when there's, you know, every car coming by, it the, fucking sucks. The problem is you have high-quality mics. So it wouldn't be a problem if you're just... You know, if we were just here, but the high quality mics pick up a higher frequency. We were playing with this idea. A shout out to Evan, by the way, who helps me edit these. He, uh, in mixing, he was finding a way where you could bring those noises down, but then. Your voice sounds all tinny and weird. No, no, no. There's two ways of doing it. There's changing for the frequency, and then he does it so when you're not talking, it's down. So basically, the cars are only there when you're talking. And that's, I find more distract. Like when I'm talking, there's no cars. And then when it's on you, we, when you're talking, we do hear it. Yeah. And it's like. Yeah, it's like when you do a friend's web series and they didn't think about the sound and there's really harsh edits in the sound. That's so funny that you say that when. <laughs> whenever some, were you giving an example or telling me to shut up? <laughs> I have about six raccoons behind me and they are, they're telling me that I should promote the vitamin water that I do have. Do it. That's your camera. We'll push in and add music. Oh, Reeby little jeebies, I'm tired. <laughs> I need something for my bones. But there's no <laughs> medicine for bones. Well, that's why vitamin I see you, you see me is here for you. It's mostly water, but that's what gets the vitamins into your body. Is there a promo code? Um, that one was enough. Yeah. But I don't want to say the promo. Code. Why? 
I don't want Dude, to. you put in so much effort for this. For the people who listen to this for Dude. some reason instead of watching it. Um, who's doing that? Who's, who's listening to podcasts? People love listening to them. Moses brought over the identical, I don't know, how big is that? Around 42 square feet New York Ikea poster yeah. that I have in the back. Ikea. I bought this from a guy on Venice Boardwalk named Philbin, and he said this, he, he had a really romantic story that he had taken this photo. Yeah, Philbit was the photographer of this. That's crazy that you got... But he said that this was an original. He said, I'll stretch it for you. It's insane. I almost lost my foot that day because I was climbing up there. And Climbing up there. He climbed yeah, he was, the building? Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a building that, that he climbed Godzilla style. And was he carrying another woman? Is that what Godzilla style? Because otherwise, wouldn't it just be anyone? Spider-Man. Godzilla and well, Spider-Man climb the same way, except for one has a woman and, or a man. Or a man. He said he was, he was carrying a woman, and then he said, here's my woman right here, and he calls his Sony A7S, his camera, the woman. Right. You know. So you brought and climbed the balcony with a huge with a poster. Huge, <laughs> huge poster, scratched up the entirety. I have a very small SUV. Um, and there's a, it's not like a nice one. It's fine. And there's a few scratches in there to force this in there. This was, is what, when I was like, hey, I'm going to be like five minutes late. It's this. Did you, is this something that you have that you're using and now it's, it's been contaminated with outside? Or is it like this thing that you had that you didn't know what to do with? I, it was up in my place. Are you going to hang it back up? I don't know. That's commitment, man. I don't man. know. I think I have to. Now. now, is it a coincidence that you haven't shaved in a little bit? Or is that, did you, like, <laughs> or did you, is that because you wanted to have a, a beard like me? I, ha I have, have not shaved, and then I had needed to severely fill it in with, uh, with mascara because nothing on, is on that my not beard real? connects. Not at all. You think that this would be real? This would be, I would be ill. Ladies and gentlemen, you just were witness to a straight as fuck glassman bop. You just got bopped, sucker. I knew it was fake. Fuck! We'll be right back with a word from Marshall Rudd Gallery. So being stuck in quarantine has given a lot of us this post-apocalyptic look, and considering that I am one of the hot guys of podcasting, I wanted to show you my routine, and I don't know how to cut my own hair, but there are certain grooming tricks that we can do, and I'm just gonna walk you through what it is, what it is, uh... So first of all, my, my hair is, is all over the place. Perfect. Support for Take Your Shoes Off podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in below the belt men's grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tooling to allow you to make your dick look much bigger. <laughs> look how big my dick is. The problem was, sometimes when I'd trim around my penis, I'd knit my nutsack. MMM. That's why Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. The Manscaped engineering team has spent 18 months creating the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created and just released the new and improved Lawn Mower 3.0. This is a premium product. It features a ceramic blade to reduce manscaping accidents. The rechargeable battery lasts up to 90 minutes. Its water resistant technology allows you to groom in the shower. Its LED light allows you to illuminate your asshole or any other grooming areas for a closer, more precise trim. Removing unwanted pubic hair adds inches onto your meaty cock. And I ask you again, please, just look at how big my penis is. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. That's M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D.com. Promo code shoes off. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Promo code S-H-O-E-S-O-F-F. -F. You know, before I used this razor, my dick was only this big. And after using Manscaped, now my dick is this big. Oh shit! Oh fuck! No, no, no! Oh! So make the right choice and visit Marshall Carpet One and Rug Gallery. And we promise, with more than 50 years as a family-owned business, we've got you covered. And we're back, and I got bopped. So my father has, I'm sure you've heard, but if you need an area rug and you go anywhere other than Marshall Rug Gallery, you probably have, and I hate to say this because it doesn't really matter, but a little dick. If you go anywhere besides Marshall's? You know, people only go if they have little dicks. But because it's the, it's the holidays, yeah. Halloween, 
Um, I was thinking I would like to make a ha a holiday Holidays? themed Holidays? I I'm sorry, but I guess is there is there holidays surrounding Halloween? It's Thanksgiving singular, plural. Is that close it's less enough? Than a, it's less Last than a month away. Thursday. It's a, it's li- it's one day away from being in the same month. Is isn't thanks is Thanksgiving closer to Christmas? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Not necessarily. Usually okay. not. Okay. All right. So the holidays are coming up. The the the, the one that's synonymous with the plural version of holiday. I think of the holidays as Halloween, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's. Satanist. What do you mean? Not many people include Satan's birthday. Actually, Satan's birthday is (laughs) is 421. 420? 420. 420? Hitler's birthday, right? Oh, coincidence. I wonder if the mom tried that. What do you mean? She's like, I'm going to wait a couple days. I... My first kiss was on 421, and I waited until after midnight so I wouldn't share it with Hitler. Oh, so important. And you, this is on birthright? No. <laughs> was your birth... I went on birthright, and it was a full-on fudge fest. I mean, that's all it is. What is it, anal sex? No, uh, everything but. <laughs> so, yes, anal sex. <laughs> yes, everything in the butt. Right. Uh, but uh, I think they are... Raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss me. They purposely pair you with 40 men, 40 women. No. 40 39 people. men. Yeah. 19 men, 20 women. <laughs> so they make it competitive. Oh, they, they even know. They're like, listen, you're not, not everyone's going to get it. Well, I just meant because you plus 19. Oh, yeah. Are people oh, yeah. still listening? <laughs> <laughs> no, they went Because on already a- this has been the most editing of any podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you got fucked by nine different I, animals. <laughs> I'm not here for the podcast. I'm here for the Instagram poll clips. Ah, the I, the IPCs. Yeah, so just keep that in mind. Next time we have an ad, it shouldn't be like, here's this brand. The ad should be drama between you and me. Maybe something that's a seed of truth. Try to take that. Yeah. We, can, I, can I give you a note? More drama in the ads. You want the poll quote. By ads, you mean a teaser. Yeah. Right. Um, no, if you're going to do an ad to get people to sit through the ads. You're saying an actual sponsored advertisement? Yeah. Well, you bring up a great, a great suggestion. What I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to take my Halloween guest. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Edit that out. Keep the burp. Edit Halloween guests out. I have a very weak stomach and just the sound of a burp is going to. That actually made me. Ugh. Um. We joke a lot, so I want to be able to tap in and out. I want you to know I'm being sincere right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 you get it. Um, <laughs> I have nothing against scatological humor. Obviously, I'm having yeah. raccoons fuck you and piss in your mug and mouth. Uh huh. But that feels like that's I'm. Um, it feels ironic to me. Like imagine if that was my sense of humor, and then it becomes my sense of humor. So it's okay to me. But when I burp like that, which. I had to burp, and I don't know why I thought to do it right into the mic. It actually felt cheap, and I got embarrassed, and I want to acknowledge that, like, you know, I, if I'm going to be smart by pissing in mugs, yeah. the, you know, the curate you it. So I I'm sorry you're, you're, for the burp. You're comfortable is what it is. You're very comfortable right now, and you feel free to burp. And the PB stuff works because it's the work of animation. Mm-hmm. Because not everyone can do that. Not everyone can get on a series of emails with an animator, and then you have to give notes. I'm like, I think the PP should splash off his shoulders, and then some should go in. So it's it classes it up. And shout out to Tom again. We'll put his Instagram handle up here. I, I I've wanted to do special episodes, and I think we're going to do it at least for Patreon. The conversations that I have with him, with just the, it doesn't work because. Then we cut back and there's still the, the poop's gone, so we have to find a way for the poop to drop and dissolve, or yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And it is, yeah. It's just so much work for the silliest, most immature I've, shit. I've, I, a show that I made it was like a, some, a, some pitch pilot. We had to make a door that was that was a, a vagina, and then just had to go like very serious because we were like mm, it's razor thin budget about like how many flaps there should be, <laughs> what's the depth, you know, where's the crest of the lady. Is this something that I could show a piece of? No. It's nowhere. It's nowhere online. It's I'll make it. By... All right. So if any of my lawyers are watching, um, yeah, that was it. That was exactly it. This so. is going to sound cocky, um, yeah. and I guess it is, but I, do, I am being serious. 
your lawyers are watching. You think so? I think a lot of people in the biz watch this now. Oh, biz in general. Not like, hey, they're worried about... No, no, Because no. everyone knows Rick Glassman's podcast as a gotcha podcast. Everyone knows that you essentially tee people up for absolute shame. Every, every question, every bit, this is, this is a takedown. This is clearly someone has a lot of animosity, toward, got disrespected at the Laugh Factory in 2013, and now it's time to get you. Oh, good. Sorry, it was a little far away. Say, I what, even were you, what were you saying? This is a gotcha podcast. What is that? What What is that? Is that this that is hair? Ho- I bought a Halloween costume for the mic because no one thinks about the mic, but we wouldn't have a show without the mic, so it's got a little. Hey, what is that? Is that a Joe uh, Exotic braid? Okay. Um, this is some of this is some of my pubic hair. Wait, right? is that real hair? <laughs> no. What is that? Because I'm a little grossed out by that being out of the mic. <laughs> soon, to be honest with you, what is that? It's like a costume uh, rat tail. But it's fake. It's fake hair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I bought it at a Halloween store. I don't think they're. I don't know. Yeah, that's gross. This thing that's is fake. That's gross. Um, Moses, uh, <laughs> let's get into it. It's you editing in real life. It's still. <laughs> I, I don't like it. Thank you. Moses, let's get into it. Please. Shall we? Yeah. Um, Moses? Yeah. You are a goofy bitch. Is that fair to say? Yeah. That's, a, that's a re- honestly a really good way to. Yeah. Uh, in in this town, LA, of course. Yeah. You know, the, the, the our biggest competition is probably the Mecca, New York City. Yeah. There is uh, there are there's a few like uh, categories that people who are far away would say is uh, is a fair descriptor. Add to this if you think of any. Okay. There's the club comic. There's the alt comic. There is the uh, s- there's the the character comic. Guitar comic. Musical. Well, let's say musical. Okay. Yeah. Right, I guess political, but that's still political. That's still maybe could someone be that like like runs the comedy scene, like it runs the blogs, but doesn't like gets up maybe twice a month, but it's just like adjacent to the comedy community. Yeah, we'll I'll stick with the other four. I think okay. it's I think it's alt, um, club, musical, and what was the other one? Those are the main three, right? Is yeah, that fair? yeah, and then and then we're not including improvisers because improvisers will for say, stand, I'm a comedian. I mean, for stand up, for stand up, for stand up, yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's hybrids along the way, but there's a few people that are uh, goofy bitches that are also quite intellectual. I am a intellectual goofy bitch. I 100%. I've never thought of this before, but yeah. I'm going to put myself in that way. You are an intellectual goofy bitch. It, it is true. Every single syllable in that is true, and I've never heard it honestly described that, that well. Thanks. Because there's a little bit of a bitch to it, too. I tried to describe all of my, like, my categories of comedians in eight syllables. Yeah. Who else falls under that? Rory Scovel? Goofy bitch? I don't know. I, I mean, he's goofy. I don't think he's... By goofy bitch, and, and I want to... Because you got to be a little sassy. There's something about a goofy bitch, and I mean, I think we're both this, so... Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm just projecting or being self-deprecating, but for somebody who is just getting a small dose and or if we're off that night or something, if we miss, I'll speak for myself. If I miss, it's not just I wasn't funny. I was also blank, annoying, offensive, aggressive. Yes. It's, a, it's a bigger swing. So if we miss, it's like, it's not just, eh, it's Jesus. That's how I feel about myself. Right. Right. Do you connect to that at all? A hundred percent. Rory, I don't see that as Rory. I feel he's like a father. Like he's he's goofy, but he he mitigates. It's not that he doesn't take risks. I mean, this is a credit to him. No. He's just kind of like he knows how to. But we go very big, so it was like, oh, they were clearly going for a joke. It was yes. not just like, oh, you said something, Ryan, offhand, or um, you know, you're just a regular person. It is something that's like, oh, that's a huge commitment. And then when you don't, if you don't get that laugh, you feel it. The whole room feels. Do you feel that when you, you said it's obviously a joke. I agree, but I've learned that I'm, that's not always true. I'm shocked, but there are people that don't know I'm joking. You could think it's not funny, but you think it's real. There's pros and cons to that. 
But do you ever take a big swing and think, it doesn't matter, they'll know I'm joking, but then you find out they didn't know, they didn't understand your intention? Depends on the content. If it's something that's going to be racist or sexist, then no. Give me an example to camera. So I'm in the car, <laughs> right? And then these come <laughs> up behind me, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, well, they recognize me, obviously. You know, I'm a The girl gets right up in my right? And then she's, how would you describe her? She's got She's got She's got, she's got one One <laughs> and then this guy who works at the grocery store, he comes up and he's got, oh yeah, he's, co he's covered in it. Couldn't tell him from a quill. If, if you want to see that raw, unedited, and uncensored, head on over to patreon.com slash take your shoes off and don't worry, you'll see it all. I like that. Can we that. salute to the Patreon fans? Yeah. Yeah. But go on. Uh, we were talking yeah. about being misunderstood. But if it's like a big act out, it's like, well, why not? There's no harm. It's like, yeah, the goof was trying to do goof stuff. It does hurt when you're on there. Hurt. Uh, like, ugh, like every time you bomb, it hurts. And it's been exacerbated with the current state of digital comedy where you can't do the same stand-up. You can't do... It's not favorable to act-outs. Um, you... I don't really know what you're doing with this Conan show. Yeah, I don't know either. Could you explain to me what it was pre-quarantine and what that is now? Because yeah, I know you're a, doing digital shows, too. Yes. It was a, a, just a live stand-up show that we would do, and then I would bring an, an actor on or someone, and I would just interview them. And so, Conan Presents, right? Coco yeah, Presents. Yeah, Conan Presents, and he would uh, pop in every once in a while and, and do the monologue with me, which is essentially just making fun of me and saying that I don't have it. Um, <laughs> and, then I would, and then I would interview uh, actor, celebrity, someone that uh, was on the show, and then it was just stand-up. So you're into that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was 2017 uh, at the uh, Comic-Con in San Diego with you and Chris Red, right? Yeah. And I didn't, uh, the reason I remember that is because I was going to that Comic-Con and then for, doesn't matter, but I ended up not going and I was really excited to go watch that. Is that right? Was that the first thing? Yeah. Yeah. The, we got hired together to host a 360 show. So there's two things. There was just a live show that we do with stand-up and then there was uh, all the digital stuff that Conan does. And this was a... Show was on the rooftop of the theater that Conan was actually in, and then Chris Red and I were hosting the show on the roof in San Diego Sun with a 360 camera that's up there that really added nothing mm -hmm. to the experience. It's just like, look how bad this rooftop looks. And um, we would bring guests on. It's like, oh, it's the cast of Teen Wolf. Right? People that were down there, and we would. I figured sweat that, them out. that you didn't. Yeah, we didn't fly them out. Call in a favor. <laughs> Couldn't fly out the Teen Wolf. People. Was Chris on SNL at the time? No, this is before. So what does that opportunity feel like to you, and then what came from it? Does that question make sense? Uh, huge. It, there's, it's very hard. I always try to like discount myself every time I get something good of like, this is a happy accident, this was... Uh, By discount yourself, do you mean you don't earn it or that it won't Yeah, that I don't earn it or just try to um, not open myself up fully to it and be like, this is exciting because then you can't get hurt because it's like, well, I knew this was going to go away anyways. Um, and with the whole Conan situation, it's something that I cannot uh, explain. They're, they've been incredibly kind to me and have essentially given me a career. I mean, mixed with this, very hard work, talent, but there's very clear moments that they have given me a career. And I mean, not only Conan, but the staff there has, has gone above and beyond. So how, did you get that, how did you get that opportunity with the two of you? Uh, JP, who is the, the booker for, for Conan, who scouts all the, the stand-ups on the show, um, he came to a show that Chris Red and I had just started. You so, had your own show, the yeah, two of you together we that you were hosting. Yeah, were just doing that meltdown. I, I had a co-host that left. He just wanted to like, take a break from the show. And then Chris came on to do a few. We immediately hit it off. Chris is so funny. He's really funny. And it's such a nice experience to be on stage with someone mm -hmm. like that, that you can truly riff at the top. You don't really have to be like, okay, well, I'll roughly talk about these things. Yeah. And it's one of those things is where... Is that because he is a certain type of funny, or you guys do feel you're on a similar frequency? Uh, well, like you, we started at improv, where it's the first rule is take care of the other person. Mm -hmm. So we know how to set each other up. And when someone speaks that language... <laughs> I was. I, it's like, we didn't get the insert, but um, I. I uh, when you said set somebody up, uh, my thought was I'm gonna snap, and either you play with it or you don't, and then you didn't, and then it made me feel like, 
was this clear that I was trying to set you up or did it seem like I'm like telling you to hurry up? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, there's been so many uh -huh. snap cuts that it's like, what are we cutting to now? Oh, we're going to cut to Portland footage where a woman gets run over. Oh, that was right. I was thinking more like a raccoon comes back. But also that's, a, I have to, because I am so interested in this conversation. Yeah. And then there's an opportunity for, because I'm, I'm watching this a lot of times. Out of your body, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm watching this, watching it from my computer, editing it. So I do I'm, the same thing. So I'm thinking like, oh, there's an opportunity for something. But then it's like, no, 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 don't be there. Yeah. <laughs> be here. And, uh, you know, you try to find that balance. Sometimes it could be distracting. I 100% um, get that. I, I haven't heard someone else say that out loud yet. It's about, even be, about stage, not being present. I can, yeah, where I can... Well, I am present enough to like react to stuff that's going on, but I always, I think from editing my own stuff and making my stuff, I always see the edit, I see the frame, I'm yeah. aware of how it looks. I want to give you, a, a, I want to give an anecdote of, of example of this. And please, I've, would you please uh, give me an anecdote of this? Right after we get back down, we're going to attack. This gentleman you may recognize from NBC's Undateable, so please do... A, 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 Jesus Christ, I fucked up. I have an intro I want you to do, sorry. You want me to do this intro? Okay. Yeah. This is unorthodox. It's for real? Okay. Um, I don't know what the fuck is going on, honestly. That is going to be a... What's happening? My grandfather was just, wasn't just a hotel owner. What are you fucking doing? Uh, don't start my, t my time yet. I gave, I gave you the wrong... <laughs> I just keep them together, okay? You keep what together? Um, you want to read this one? Yeah. Okay. You guys are in for a real treat. Please put your hands together for Ron Gladish. All right. It's, uh, it's Rick Glassman. That is my mistake. There was a stand-up show I did. It was Just for Laughs, uh, HBO taping, and I did, had my set, and it's fine. Everything is always fine once you have it. You know, once it's not fresh, it's fine at best. Yeah. So I'm like, I, I'm not, this isn't special. I've done it at least four times. Yeah. So I want to think of something. And I ended up doing something that I knew wouldn't play to the audience, but it wasn't for them. It was for the people at home. Basically, it was, um, uh, it was me giving John Doerr, who was hosting, the wrong intro and realized, and I just had all these different, he did the first half of my set by all these intros that I gave. Um, and the audience had no idea what was going on. But to me, when you're watching this on YouTube or wherever you can, and it says comedian gives host the wrong intro, they're in on it from the beginning. Yeah. So I'm now bombing. And if I don't bomb, I'm failing. It needs to be what's going on. And my agent at the time, right after this, I'm thinking like, I couldn't have done that for what it was, I could have, you know, I never prepped it. But for what I had, everyone believed every moment of it. Perfect. And yeah. I was shocked when my agent came up to me and it was the only time, because they don't tell you when you do, don't do well. They say, you know. No, that was fun. That's what you hear. Fun stuff, fun stuff. Yeah. This was, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. What, why did you? Ooh. And, I, and it wasn't like I thought, oh, she doesn't get it. It was, wait, what am I missing? Yeah, you know what I am, right? I wasn't like going off like Kramer up there. But what I was, what I learned now is, oh, I'm watching this from a different place in the universe. Like you're saying, you're watching it from a different plane. Yeah. And, uh, and you see the bigger picture. Like I, I'll do like man on the street stuff or stuff with real people. And I just, I'm like, I know what I need for the edit. I know, example. right? I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Talk. I know what to say to get you there. That I always see the edit. Have you found a, a way have you found a life. way as a stand-up comedian to let the audience in on it enough to where you don't break the fourth wall, but they could be on board with you instead of you fucking with them? Yeah, I did that with the last Comedy Central set I did. Um, that I where I talk about what what the state of comedy was before everything shut down, when everyone was just putting up Instagram clips that was just really bastardizing what stand-up is because it was just making it essentially Vine. Are you saying you, after quarantine? Uh, but this was before quarantine. It was like the end of uh, last year. So what do you, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it was like as far as like letting the audience in. As far as not like fucking with them and be like, you guys are weird. It's like, listen, this is embarrassing. This is something and you guys, I'm on your guys' side. Did you, how did you, what did you do? What, what's the technique? What did I do? I was just 100% honest and I was angry that night. It was a very badly run show. I had, was working full time on the sitcom. So I left that. 
went to this taping that was late, and then they didn't have the next audience for the next one because it was ran so late. But this late. is a taping? This is a taping. And this is on... Uh, they didn't have an audi- the, the next audience? The next audience, a lot of the next audience didn't show up. So then they came on the loudspeaker and they're like, do you guys, uh, if you're here, oh. and they've already sat through a so three-hour late show. No. And they brought them back and then got them boozed up. And oh, then that sucks. I was like, okay, well, just don't put me first. And they put me very first. What, what, where can people see this? Uh, it's on Comedy Central's YouTube. Yeah. Were you happy with the results? I was happy with it. I don't remember a good portion of it. In a non-lie of like, I was just in the zone, man. Uh, I don't remember a lot of it, but it was the most fun I've had probably doing a taping. Um, I've seen you live a couple of times. I've seen yeah. clips. I may have seen this, but I've definitely on your Instagram seen some clips of yours. It's so funny. Your shit's so funny. But back to the... Uh, Thank you, because the first time that you and I performed together, I thought you hated me. Was I that thought, when you went to Greenblatt's after? No. The first time that we performed together was in a typhoon in Arizona. It was... Uh, no, oh no. Was, yeah, it was. I've never been, done a show in Arizona. You... hundred Okay, so Ron Funches was our headliner. It was me, you, Brandon Mordell, and your puppet. Oh, I was the host. Wait. It was a corporate job, so I had to play, right. play nice. And I was like... Uh, I was going on some riff about, like the hackiest, like, easiest joke of, like, this guy likes porn, right? Where you're just, like, getting through for the corporate thing, and then you go up there with the puppet, and you start saying the hackiest lines from, from my set, and I'm just in the back, just like, oh, Because I'm already so intimidated by you guys. This was, like, maybe right after Undateable, and I was so lucky to have this job. I felt like <laughs> the biggest fraud, and it was just, like, riffing, and, and just, like, oh, if I ever saw a tape of myself, talking about porn on stage i would i would die so i was from your perspective and i unfor- i remember the set now yeah. but i don't remember what you're talking about yeah. but i was making fun of you or i was using what you were doing uh in my uh, in in retrospect having more experience in comedy you were using what i was doing in my head i was like oh, i just got called out for being the biggest hack I don't remember what our first thing was or whatever. I yeah. just... I oh, just, I remember it so clear. Uh-huh. Shame. I remember uh-huh. every time I was <laughs> in deep shame. Because they had... It was a typhoon was over Arizona. So they, they rushed the whole audience in. And they're like, let's just start it now. And it was run yeah, by this... It was a this, big place. Yeah. It was, it was essentially like where you would go in a storm. It was like concrete floors. <laughs> evacuation place. And then they rushed the crowd in. And then they were just like, just go up now. And, it, and they had no idea how stand-up works. So... Even while people are getting seated, they're like, as the host, go up there every five minutes and tell people the show's about to start. So people were just angry every time they saw me because I was like, well, this is tease. And, you know, had maybe 10 minutes of material. Tops did 40. And when then, was that? Um, that was 2016. Yeah. It was only four years ago. Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Uh, 2011? Oh. I'm saying like, like 10 minutes that I'm still proud of today. Yeah. Everything else in 2016 is like, yikes. But that was like a turning point. Well, I, I, the, the point I was making is, uh, back to the silly intellectual bitch, I like, you're, you post a clip, I'm going to watch it. You know, it's like, there's something special about your stuff because, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you're finding something. It seems like you're always finding something, whether it's improv or physical space, yeah. climbing something, yelling at something, and it's not just doing it to do it. There's just like, you, I mean, look at what you brought the fucking poster. Like, yeah. you love the bit. Like, you, you'll marry a I bit. I love it. Yeah. I love it, and I always feel like a part of it is is like inadequacy of like, you, you should do more. But the part of me just feels so lucky to do this job that it's like, well, why not give it everything you have? Why not give people a story? I just think it's so much to ask in 2020 for people to watch just a guy on stage talk. It made 100% sense in the 40s when that was a form of entertainment and it was like you could watch that or a train go by. But now there's just so many opportunities. So that's what I like about your podcast. It's like, yeah, mix it up. Have some fun. Make it a video. Make the... <laughs> I, my doctor said stop having piss berries. The idea of someone going up there and talking, I think about that all the time, but I still think it works. I just think it it's not as easy I, as just some people can do that. Uh, Dave Chappelle can do three hours, and I've seen it, of just talking, finding the bit. 
I think people think way too high of themselves and they think they're interesting enough to go, ah, what else? What, you know, I was thinking about like, no, 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 no. You haven't earned that. <laughs> you have not earned yeah. that. You're so lucky to be up there. Even in a conversation when someone's talking to you, a lot of the time they're like, okay, yeah, and then my thing, my thing will fit in there, my thing now. So just like make the most of it. You're asking a lot out of people to be silent. Don't be on your phone. Look at me. Sit and, here. And do it for an hour or 45 minutes yes. even. That's how I feel about podcasts. And I don't want to talk too much into it because who cares? And I have done it. But you've done a podcast before? I've, I've done a Yes. But the idea of, I'm saying I've had this conversation. Yeah. But the idea of how many people, especially since quarantine, start a podcast, and they probably are funny and interesting people. A lot of them are. But that doesn't mean you could just sit down and be funny and interesting. Because it's hard. Yes. And you either need to prep or have a certain dynamic or whatever. And like you said, uh, I, I believe you said that it's an inadequacy thing you feel. Yeah, I mean, part of that. But if you really, if you really dig down, it's just it's it is a respect thing of like everyone thinks that they're the most interesting person, and it, that that goes both ways. So if you want to accept the side that's like not everyone in the world's mad at me, I'm just being in my head, right? I'm just I blew that situation. Then you have to take the other side. You have to take the other you're side. You're saying that taking you responsibility are, sometimes. Yeah, so if you're like, not everyone cares about me, it's okay that I said something shitty at that party, no one really cares. You have to take the other side where it's like, yeah, even when you're up there doing your best, not a lot of people give a shit yeah. about that either. So be your best or not. I know. The raccoons have a bike. They have a little motorcycle. I think I'm done editing. Uh, we're done with animations. That we can't afford it? Uh, we're out? I don't know. Come on, guys. Vitamin juice. It's in a bag. It's like Gogurt, but it's vitamin. You know what? Let's get a little money. We'll be right Let's back. Let's get a little money. Hello. We interrupt this episode to invite you to join our Patreon. Here's a clip from this month's exclusive episode with Melissa Villasenor. All right. I think our improv scene was hilarious. Yeah, I thought it was really good. Um, <laughs> I thought it was really, really, really good. Okay. What are we doing? Tell me. Um, you have a local ice cream shop and I'm the, <laughs> the the who's the person that makes the A's and B's rates rates the shops restaurants the food uh, uh, inspect health health uh, inspectors. grade inspector so yeah I, I'm coming by to tell you I'm giving you the boot give me the boot or giving me a bad <laughs> grade oh giving you a bad grade okay <laughs> uh, all right <sighs> there you go oh you could just throw it anywhere it doesn't really matter we'll uh we'll clean it up when we get to it um hi hey hey uh, uh teresa are you must be are, are you the owner mr jeff frosty mr Fro jeff frosty yes i am <laughs> okay jeff. get your scoop well that's sweet but i'm just here i'm the health inspector so i'm just coming by to <laughs> <coughs> i'm coming by to check up on your ice cream shop that I know the city loves so much, uh, two scoops in one cup. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, we named it after that that viral video of the girls dumping in a cup. Okay. Yeah, hey guys, uh, we're out of soap in the bathroom, so just I'm sorry, use hot water. So I'm just gonna do an inspection, um, look in the cafeteria in your ba <laughs> the back in there, and <laughs> yeah, well, help yourself, and if you change your mind, you want a scoop. You could just come back here and take it yourself, or I'll give a flying fuck. This is a neighborhood-friendly store where we like people to help themselves. Oh, my God. I, I have to pee. Yeah. Uh, oh, you could use the bathroom. We're, we're, we're running low on soap. Rick, I have to pee. I don't want, I, if you make me laugh more, I'll pee my pants. Just put the towel down. No. This I, is an ice cream shop where we encourage I'm peeing when you have to. Cut, cut the scene. Cut. Could you do that on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> if something's happening where you might have to pee... Would you stand up and call cut? Visit patreon.com slash take your shoes off or click the link in the description. Now take your shoes off and enjoy the rest of the episode. That's a great idea. If you want to hear what he just said, oh, wait, we Page. cut to commercial. We cut to a commercial. Right. Well, just, it was a commercial for your new book. Yeah. Um, uh, where, where, where were we? We're talking Pittsburgh's about inaccuracy. Make the most of it if you're on stage. It, you're asking a lot out of any audience to not only watch you do stand up, but this goes the same if you if you make videos, if you put things on social media. Especially if you're asking, you know, there's, it's it's uh, it's hard enough 
to have people come out to see you or at our level, tell me if I'm wrong, sometimes out to see us and other times out for comedy and we happen to be the people that they're seeing. Yes. Um, so, you know, there's something to the professional side of this business, which is, and I'm speaking for myself, but I, I want to speak for us with this, which is I love experimenting and playing so much. And I've been doing this for um, 13 years now. And I could say for the past three years, I'm a funny stand-up comedian. But for the first nine at least, I, I didn't think I was, but I knew I would be. And my, my only responsibility to myself was keep playing, figure it out, you'll get there. And there's that balance of still, I think we'll always be trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. But at a certain point when people are paying to see you, it's not just about me figuring it out. And who gives a fuck if I buy, like, it, you have to yeah. give to them. That's my least favorite person. But I don't give a fuck if I bomb out there. It's like, whatever the show is, give it your all and make something happen for them. It's something I learned very young watching Conan. And then he later told me and confirmed is that... People are going to laugh. You're at away the from thing. the mic. I'm sorry. Keep going. People are always going to laugh at the thing that happens in the moment more than the most well-crafted, well-written callback to a joke. You could spend hours on that. But if something happens in the crowd, like, hey, this guy likes porn, that's going to get a way bigger laugh. But the, this guy likes porn isn't the art. No, it's not the art. But making something happen live, if you are doing the medium of live comedy everyone's secretly going, I believe, to be like, ooh, what if they talk to us? What if something happens in the crowd? But, but what about... So, so do you rely on... A, a, if you know that you have to do an hour, is there, a, is there a section that is set for crowd work for that reason? The whole thing should be, because then it feels really forced. Be, I don't know why any stand-up that does this, okay, I'm going to do a little crowd work. Well, right. What, what are you doing? Um, it hasn't been like that for the past year because I've been working on uh, my special, which is supposed to tape in May. But oh, you had a, 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 a date already for it. Uh, yeah, it was a HBO special. HBO was, Max? HBO Max, yeah. Uh, so not as good. And it is... Uh, HBO uh, Max is awesome, by the way. Maybe you were being great. self-deprecating. It's... It's no, it is. It's I think they're they're having a little trouble on the upstart because they not they're not clear on what the five year plan is that all of HBO is going to go away and everything is going to become. HBO I didn't know Max. what HBO Max was until I got it, but yeah, it's it has everything. everything Warner Brothers, all the backdated shows, new stuff, all the HBO stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think people need to better understand what it is. They, yeah, they're roping it in with like a, a Quibi or an Apple thing, and it's like, well, no, it's just it's eventually it's all going to be HBO. Yeah, it's HBO plus so many yeah. things. It's not just uh, TV. It's not just TV. It's HBO Max. It's HBO. <laughs> So you had an hour, an hour that you're ready for, but you can't make it. Yeah, really ready. Had a director locked in. I built uh, a set that's just like a pile of uh, all white trash, and uh, yeah, it was great. Um, but I can't wait to shoot it. I think a lot of it holds up. I don't know about you. If you feel like anything, I mean, you don't really talk about like dating in an Uber is weird, but material's gonna have to change after this. The um, uh, as I was starting to do longer sets, I realized not only will it be very hard to come up with an hour of, of special stuff, yeah. it's hard enough to do two, show, like a, two shows on a Friday. I just think that's, I mean, congrats to everyone, and I've done, I, that's what you have to do. But if I am running a marathon, which is what that shit is, I can't give it another go. So I feel it's more sustainable and also better to let the audience breathe. So for the past couple of years, and this is why I think I've become better, I um, I have those like those big moments, but I need to be able to just fucking chill. Yes. Um, but none of that stuff was very relevant. Like it's not like it would suck if your material was nothing bad and you know nothing bad's gonna happen. Yeah, uh, things are going too well. Or like you know talking about Trump's impeachment. You uh -huh. have an impeachment chuck like no one gives a shit about that. Um, yeah, it is. It is weird. I think a lot of it holds up. It's still relevant. Still talking about poverty in America. It seems like more people are in the loop on that. But um, it is this thing of like, fuck. I mean, you gotta. Everyone's gonna have a COVID chunk after this. Do you? I want to. I want to finish up that 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 Conan thing. Yeah. That origin stories. But uh, I don't know much of. But I do know a little bit of your past, your childhood, 
and yeah. I think it's very interesting. And you comfortable getting into it a little yeah, bit? Absolutely. But first, I want to I want to go back to you got this opportunity. You and Chris are doing a show. I want to know that feeling of like, oh, here it is for Conan, and how important that feels to you. And and then when you realized, oh, I did a good job to continue this relationship. Oh shit. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's a couple things there. So. The, the broader stroke is I was so lucky to get hired at that show. I mean, my heart was racing when I met Conan in the hallway for the first time. And it was a one-off show. A- yeah, at first. it was like a Comic Con. Um, I mean, it was a Comic Con thing they were trying. They were like partnering with something. Yeah, and then he was going to come up there once on the first episode, say like, "Hey, I approve this," and I'm out. And then uh, every single day for the next five days that we were down there, he came up and he did 20 minutes of time with Chris and I which was so just cool. like insane. I was like trying to write improv before, just freaking out. And um, yeah, it was great. I mean, I really leaned on Chris because he's such a strong performer. It's just someone that knows. I'm like, okay, well, he, he can tell if I'm going on a story that's too long or going nowhere. By leaned on him, do you mean that like he's going to make you funnier? He's going to stop you from doing too much? What do you mean? Yeah, he'll stop me from doing too much. He can set me up for things. Did you like, guys plan this? Did or do you just is no, that the No, it's the just a thing that we have that is very unique to find because I, I think we've all seen shows where like two stand-ups are hosting and they're usually competing for the, the limelight or the laugh and it's very rare you get someone that you can truly riff with because you're both trying to make the other person look good. So he has that and he set me up for a story where I told Conan essentially how much he meant to me and that... Uh, was not allowed to watch TV growing up, anything at all. We were very religious. And the one show I would watch, the one show, like, I didn't see Star Wars until pretty recently, uh, was Conan. I would secretly record that at night. And I was able to, like, tell him that. That's cool. You yeah. had a bonding moment with Conan? Yeah. Or just, it was honest. It wasn't like this, like, false thing. It was just like, I just want to tell someone and, and thank them for providing an escape for me and it's the it's the very reason i do this it's the reason i do this stuff is 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 having uh, providing the same type of feeling hopefully for someone else i mean of course there's my ego and i like this and i like money but there's also what attracted me to entertainment is it was such an escape for me it it helped so much level me out that there was a world outside of the hell i was in and um yeah if i could give back or be a part of that machine I would love to but the, the far as like I got it I'm in is um, after I did my first sh- set on the show which is shortly after that that show um, Conan said the meanest thing to me and I knew I was in I was like that means it went well what do you say uh, so I so I did the set I go over to the couch and he goes it was pretty funny it's a shame that none of that's gonna air and I right. was just like, oh, I felt so good. Because he felt comfortable enough to, knowing that he could do that. Yes, because that's how comics talk to each other. We say the meanest things to each other, and it's not... Like, if Conan just comes over and says, like, it was great, great job, that was really funny, it's like, you know... Like what we're saying he's agents being do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But if a comic has said something that's a little shitty, they know you can take it. And that was the first moment I was like, I ah, felt so great. He's one of, one of the few kings in this business, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I it's it's and he likes you. It's amazing. He likes people that he can kind of punch down to and improvise with and and make fun of. There was um, the straight man people. Uh, I want to tell the, the story of when I first met him. Yeah, please. Uh, this is this is great. I love this. So, um, I guess it's just a simple way of explaining. And you, you were you were working on the lot the same time yeah, I was on, that he was. I was on Undateable. Yeah, uh, very close to where they shoot at Warner Brothers, and. Conan is, in a different way than you, he was, you know, that's, I didn't watch Letterman, I didn't watch Carson, I just, you watch Conan every night. Yeah. And Brent Morin worked on Conan, so uh, he knew Sona, and, which by the way, great episode, check out our episode with Sona, and... Can I watch the whole episode real quick? Hello! I'm Sona Movesessian! And I'm so proud and happy to be on the Take Your Shoes Off podcast. Please subscribe. Please subscribe and like the videos and the podcasts on all the formats that they're available. Thank you very much. <laughs> do you want me to do Prince Philip too? And we're back. I can't believe her husband's name is Tack. Uh, so, yeah, so, you, so, so I go over there uh, and... We're talking to Sona, and then Conan happens to walk by, and 
for whatever reason, Conan likes comedians or likes people. You know, he's just he, he likes the play. type of comedian you are. I've seen him interact with other people. He likes to be the straight man, and he likes improv if he initiates it. If he initiates it, that, yes. Because I didn't know him yet, but when he walked by, he initiated. He was in a play mood, and that that would already have been something I'll remember for the rest of my life. But he want he likes playing alpha. Yes. He is an alpha that, that likes to pretend he's beta playing an alpha. No, but if yes, if you've taken improv sense? before, you know those people that will steamroll, that, that are just alphas in the scene. They'll go, they'll continue any bit as long as they started it. And he and it's it's you know it's why he is who he is. He is in control whether he takes yeah. it or he allows someone to give it to him. So he has this dynamic with Sona where she's the assistant. They obviously love each other, but he likes to you know do this and yeah, like shit on her a little bit. So he invited Brent and I into his office just so he could shit on Sona by not including her in something. So this wasn't a bit to play with us. This was a bit to shut her down. But now we're in the office. Yeah. And we're, we're talking, and then he gets into serious mode for a second. He's like, so tell me about, that's interesting. Yeah, tell me about your, your, your parents. And uh, I talk about my dad at his area rug store. I mention the rug. I say, you know, I can get him a pad. I explain what the rug is, and I was on with everything. I I really like this rug. I'm uh, in the market for a rug. Are you? Yeah. Hello, this is Prince Philip. I just want to tell you why you should go to Marshall Rug Gallery. That was great. Every hold on. Every time after I hunt pheasants, I go there and I buy a rug. I love it so much. Oh, uh, family owned since a few years. <laughs> you forgot how long it's been family owned. With more than 50 years as a family owned business, we've got you covered. And there was a bit that I've done. I, I, I do Boy Are My Arms Tired punchlines. I've been doing them my entire career. 100%. And they never work because they don't work. Well, surely they have to work. Now they do. I figured it out. Surely. But the first laugh that I got from somebody was with Conan. And uh, he said, so what, are your, what, is your, uh, what, is your, what do your parents do? And I said, my dad is a rug store. And he said, what does your mom do? I don't even remember what it was, but it was a yeah. quick thing. And I said, and Boy Are My Arms Tired. Uh, he laughed. Uh, I just, all right, I'm going to, you know, you get out on the laugh. But yeah, it, was, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was playing to the idea of, like, we all know you get out on a laugh. So, like, I'm, am right. I doing this right, Conan? Yeah. All right, I'm going to get out. <laughs> and then something happened. I saw a smile on his face. He came out. He followed. He did bits with me. And ever since then, he's, he plays with me. When I'm on the lot, you know, I'm on a lot, the six lead dot com on a TV show, he'll yell, hey, Rick, you know, as if, like, he wants to be friends with me. Yeah. Anyway, that story it's, was too long. I'm sorry. Crazy. No, 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 no. I know exactly what you're talking about. It feels great to get in. You made a huge ballsy move. One, one laugh. There yeah. was one particular you're laugh. In. I remember the laugh. And then there's a dynamic and how he, he, he that he remembers my face, let alone my name. And then I, I was dating a girl and we went to the, the Conan um, holiday party and, uh, I'm just sitting around and he comes up to me and in his head, I think he was like, I'm going to make Rick look good in front of his new girl, but it's coming up in like making me as if I paid him to do it. Yeah. And it's just, oh. So generous. So I've been around him enough where he's been like tired, cranky. Something has gone terrible. We did that whole tour together. And it is it, honestly someone that is so genuinely nice. It really doesn't need to be. He could be a little bit more of an asshole and still have people say that's the nicest guy in the world. And that's the, what the rare people that I've met. And it actually hurts you when you meet other people that you look up to. He's like, why can't everyone... Be like him, but yeah. uh, so kind. Um, I, I, want to, I want to hear all the Conan stories and stuff, but I definitely want to get yeah. into the, uh, the you know, you, a religious background and you come from a place of, I'll let you tell the story. Oh, yeah. Well, the reason my name's all jacked up is uh, my... Your name's all jacked up. <laughs> Moses Storm, right? Uh, I always just figured you did porn. Yeah. This guy does porn over here for sure. Look at this guy. He's, 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 he's like you're in a jersey. You like you're on the team of Jack Off. Put in applause. Put in applause. <laughs> this guy over here. Ride the wave now. <laughs>, Laughs. I know. I know. Uh, lock me up, folks. Lock me up. <laughs> this guy likes to get locked up, right? Bondage. No, uh, no, 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 no. So you had a rough childhood. Yeah. Uh, rough childhood. Uh, my parents were desperately trying to get into a doomsday cult, um, but always kind of falling short. But maybe could, that was part of Could you explain the, what that means? It's a mix of Judaism and Catholicism that uh, my great uncle started. 
and there's two other families in it. So he basically doctored two religions, like making his own sauce. Yeah. He just picked a couple of pieces. He picked, yeah, like a greatest hits, and then, like, do you have a rabbi or anyone in your life? Oh. Yes. Mazel. Uh, so the religion is against any, any rabbi, any pastor. No organized religion is right. No one should be in school. Hospitals are wrong. Beyond anti-vaxxing, uh, any establishment, anti-establishment, but it's not fun. It's not like, we eat hippie cult. It's like Old and New Testament, strict. These are the ways. Everything else is wrong. The world's about to end any day. Few will be saved, like in the days of Noah, is what I would hear. Uh, it's all going to go away. We're all going to die. And maybe if you're lucky, God will save you. But everyone else you see is going to burn in hell. Were your parents raised by this, or did they get into it when they were older? No. I think like a lot of white people that get involved in cults, it's just not special people that feel like they should be special. And that's what's alluring. Is that a white thing? Yeah. Yeah, because they have very little adversity in your life, and it just feels... I don't know if it's a white thing. It's like a, it's like a Midwestern, I want to be special type of thing. And no one feels so it's like... become they, a comedian or a cult. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which I'm going to do both eventually. But people just feel like, oh, I should... They feel so entitled, like they shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't feel sad. It's like, well, that's what life is. But that's the people that get involved in cults. Because like, well, me, I shouldn't be nothing and have to suffer and get shit on at my job. Okay, so uh, they start this cult. And how old is everybody once this starts? This is before I was, I was even born. So born into it. Pretty quickly, we, we stopped renting the house we were renting in Ohio. And my parents bought an old Greyhound bus that they ripped mm -hmm. the seats out of and then r very roughly converted into an RV. Do you like, have pictures of this? Yeah, I do. Do you mind if we put them up? Not at all. Okay. And we're back. Uh, that's just the outside, but the inside is like, it's hell in there. And uh, we, we travel around for most of my life in that bus, traveling state to state, street preaching at people. Siblings? Yes, four siblings. You have a younger sister, and then everyone else is, is a year apart. So the there's the seven of you, your parents and the five kids? Yeah, all crammed in this bus. So there's still some seats, right? No seats. So no what are you guys doing when you're driving? My Just dad's in a seatbelt. There's a constant carbon monoxide leak with a diesel engine in the back. So I would honestly, like the air would get wavy and I'd wake up in a new state. And you're laying on the floor? Yeah, laying on the floor, laying in the, in the bunk beds, um, reading Seven the Bible. Seven the, There was a total of five beds. And then, then my dad and my mom had a bed in the front. It was just, But my dad forgot to measure for the, the mattress when he built the bunk beds in the back. So the top of the bunk bed is right here. Wait a minute. So you're born, and yeah. then how, at what age are you on the bus? One and a half. So like so I barely remember the house that we were in. Yeah, I'm a baby. We pretty much very quickly go into the bus. My mom is really the dominant one in the relationship. She's the one that's really like, let's do it. My dad's kind of like, okay, going along with He's it. He's Jewish. Yeah. Your mom's not. No, she grew up hardcore Catholic. So it was kind of like a fuck you to her parents. Um, but I'm sorry, was it, it was your gr grandfather who created this, or you uh, say great uncle? My great uncle. So, so grandfather's generation. Yeah, so then my, my, uh, my grandpa and, and my great uncle, they did not get along. So by her joining that cult, it was like, well, fuck you. Okay, so I'm sorry, you're one and a half, you're in a crib? Uh, I'm walking, you know, it was pretty advanced, you know. I was learning how to kickflip. And you, so you're, you're, you... You uh, have some older siblings. What are, what are the age differences? How old are the older ones? Uh, I have an older brother that's a year older than me. Uh, he's 31. And then um, I have uh, another older brother and then my oldest sister. And then I have a younger sister. But so there's, like a year. there's babies. It's three babies. Yeah. And two children. Two children. And, and what are they doing? They're going and they're doing like uh, snake oil stuff? Not snake oil, yelling at people. And, and uh, so we'd go to, let's say, a, a concert's going to allow. I remember we went to a Rolling Stones concert, just like people are filtering out parking lot, big music festival, maybe a street fair. And we have large neon signs that say you're headed for hell, you're all going to burn. And as soon as we were able to talk, we would have to... Uh, cold open strangers go up to them and be like, you're headed for hell. Which, what are the accents? That's my accent as a baby. Uh, 
So how old are you when you have to say that to strangers? I think I started saying it at two. Wait, you're you're waddling up to strangers. Waddling saying, up to strangers, and people are like, "Hey!" Because kids don't come up to you; they hide behind their parents' legs. So people are they're so open; their guards are down. Hey, look at you! And I'm like, "Yeah, had it, you're gonna burn in hell." Did you understand what that meant? Not at all. What's your earliest memory of that? I knew that they were very mad. I knew that he got very upset. How the, how the fuck did you tell your kids that? How? What's your earliest memory of you remembering that you're doing this stuff? Uh, we were, well, I guess because there's photos of it, that that memory stays fresh. We were at Col in Columbus, Ohio at um, a marathon or a 5K. And um, yeah, I, I, this woman with like teased up bangs, I went up to her I told her that she was going to hell. And she goes, what did you just say to me? And I completely froze because I'm two. And then she started yelling <laughs> at my mom for, for saying that. What yeah. happens once you get, did you guys convert anybody? And then we would give them like a, a track, a pamphlet, a little like propaganda thing and tell them some Bible verses and then essentially yell at them. But no one ever followed the cult. This is what I mean of like, it's an unsuccessful cult. Like that first act of every Netflix documentary of the cult, they always have like, and everyone was doing yoga and more people were joining and we opened multiple centers in Phoenix, in Portland. And this was like, no one was interested. They're failing. And the cult leader, my great uncle, was kind of keeping them on the rope of like, you're still going to hell. Thank you for sending me money. Uh, and so like you, you keep investing because you keep trying to seek his approval. How old does this stop? And are you close with your parents? I was 10. It stopped at the same time like my parents' relationship fell apart is when that fell apart. And then there was a trial uh, with the other family that was in it, uh, Andrea Yates, who had, uh, she killed her kids because God told her to, which is something I heard growing up. And this is, uh, the, you get the you older you people? get. Yeah. Well, there's photo. I barely remember them, but there's photos of us together, uh, of, of her kids and us. And playing. she's in prison. Yeah, she's in uh, like a, a mental hospital for life, um, and and Rusty is is remarried, and they were uh, yeah. So so that that's really when it fell apart because that became that was like right before nine eleven. That was the biggest story. The two thousand two thousand one one. Yeah. So no, this is the two thousand six one. So five years after. Yeah, five years after that 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 nine eleven that right. every, no one really talks about. No, it was, it was before, right before that. It was like a month before. So then the conversation changed to terror. Um, so, so then so, the heat died down. But then everything went, just went their separate ways. What happens to you, when you're 10 uh, and your parents get divorced? Who are you living with? Do you want I to I live with... This is completely true, and it sounds like a bit. But my mom got full custody of us, provided that my dad get full custody of the bus. <laughs> this is not a good, good bus, by the way, too. Is this custody or just ownership? Like Custody. He, well, he gets the deed to the bus or whatever, because my mom technically bought it. Does that make you feel like your dad doesn't want you, or is that that your mom doesn't want your dad to have you? Uh, well, you know, I get my dad. You always have a soft spot for something you made. So, I, no, I think it's just like my mom was wanted us, essentially, or, or wanted to take care of it. My dad was just kind of apathetic at the time. He's is come there, around now where he's like, oh, I wish I would have been there, but... Um, is, there any, is there any conversation with courts of, of, uh, uh, of these babies not being handled in a way that, that is safe? Not at all. I mean, this is the Florida court system. I mean, everyone's getting... it was Ohio. Clear. Well, now we're in Florida by the time they divorce. We were moving a lot growing up. It's really hard to keep track of, of where we were, but I know when they divorced, we were in Florida, and then my dad gets like weekend visits provided he pays child support he stopped paying child support and then uh my mom moved us across the country came out to california for a little bit and and then i didn't see my dad for 15 years after that until uh until i reconnected with him i think it was maybe like 22 or 23 and then uh he he came back around how is that possible if, if you were 10 when it happened i don't know i don't know what the i don't uh, want to get into what numbers the years semantics. yeah i don't i'm not familiar i could be it could be less than what's your than relationship 15. with your parents now it's like a business relationship my mom is really leveled out and you know is very sorry for that time and the older i get the more i understand what she was going through because after that i mean it was just extreme poverty after we left my dad and we were on our own because my mom has no job we're not in school There's, you were homeschooled by your mom right uh, even that's generous i mean Thank i've you. literally never been to school 
Uh, there's I uh, you don't barely read or write. No, no GED. Um, Wait a still you, learning how to spell as we speak. And <laughs> I would love if it, we the, didn't call attention to it, but the yeah, it was S S O X T H. Yeah, or something. well, I am also dyslexic and dysgraphic, and so is my mom. And sometimes her signs would be misspelled, so it'd be like you're headed for heel. Or a better example. Are there any? Are, is this is this a, a, an outcome for your siblings as well? Because a lot of that is genetic, if I'm not mistaken. What? Um, dyslexia and uh, and um, yeah. Well, everyone has learning disabilities, and well, it's just behind. I mean, we've right never. I went to one one semester of school because we were scamming the welfare system. In order to continue to receive welfare in Florida, you have to uh, prove that your kids are in school. So these checks and balances. So what my mom did is she enrolled uh, myself and, and my younger sister into into middle school and just enough time to get the paperwork so that she could forge the names and the grades for the rest of the kids. Uh, but what I didn't know is I when I, I took the administrative test to get in, I had tested so low that I was placed in special ed. Uh, but I just thought, I was like, everyone's nice. I've never been to school, so I didn't really have a barometer for it. But then it was mm. maybe like a weekend. to like, yeah, you're going to go to the bathroom? <laughs> okay. All right, well, you call me if you need any help. And then I was like, mm. and then I start looking around. The kids are in wheelchairs. There's like severe cerebral palsy. And I'm like, oh, and then it just felt like shit. Because you're, you you're not sensitive to it at 12. You're just like, well, I'm not one of these people. Uh, I was in... Uh a, a specific kind of special ed in uh, right because uh, there is two. Ninth. There's two. There's like kids that are actually in wheelchairs, and then there's just kids that are maybe a little off track. Maybe they're on the spectrum somewhere. Maybe they're just bad. Is that the one you were in? Yeah, um, I was in first. I was in one that was uh, uh, like just a learning disability class. Yeah, which is kind of like uh, it's like uh, I guess it would be like I don't know anything about baseball, but triple A. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you know you're yeah. good at being learning disabled, but you're not pro yet. Right, and then after a few months of that, I, I got sent up to the majors or down to the real or whatever the analogy metaphor would be, but that was the one where like you can't leave your box and you have to have a guard or somebody take you to the bathroom and watch you and and it's all one class yeah. essentially you don't go to different classes right. you stay in one room for the, for a half day uh. so you're there for for six hours or something um, and it's one room and then they just you get the books for the other classes and. Yeah, yeah, that's that was also clued me in is the way they would talk to you and the fact that we would all stay in that one room and I was like, oh, there's a history poster and then there's phonics and then there's there's like okay, this is covered too. The much. difference is though, I didn't grow up. I went through eight grades where it wasn't the case, so I knew I was sent to something. But you so go you in, felt it immediately. Yeah, I, I wasn't allowed to go on the Washington D.C. trip. Uh, I was kids would say like, "Where are you?" And I didn't even. I still don't know how to explain what it was. But I do remember I was a little embarrassed. What do I say? Was I'm, there was there an outbreak that you had? Was there some sort of tantrum you had, or it was just like the grades kept going down? It wasn't even the grades. It was, um, and I'm remembering my perspective. So I still don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do know I went to the learning disabled class, and I was uh, testing things. For whatever that means. I was hyper and asking a lot of questions and I had a learning disability and I was clearly distracting other kids. Yeah. So we need to find a way of giving, you know, getting them out of here into something we could put because in Because you were hole. asking questions or you were being like a class clown, you were talking? What, how all, were you distracting of, There was kids? no, there was a, yeah, I was being distracting. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if I talked about this on the podcast, but uh, I remember in third grade, there was a uh, shout out to Mrs. Pate, by the way. You know, you have some teachers that you remember they really tried. She was yeah. one of them. Yeah, she was my same teacher. Oh, you had Pate. Yeah. And she, I remember she had me take a test under her desk, like under, uh, you know, sitting Indian style. It's dark. Could you say Indian style or do you have to say Indian form? No, you can say just like cross-legged. Cross-legged. Native yeah. American style? Crisscross applesauce. Uh, Crisscross applesauce yeah. style. And she said to me, uh, I, I want to see what you're able to do when you're not so distracted, which was true. And that made sense to me then. It wasn't until within the past few years, because I always remembered that there was like, oh, she was also seeing what, you know, she was also trying to have me not distract other people. You know, we have yeah. this narrow sided, like you were almost saying when you was, uh, what was you were saying, like uh, people, uh, oh, they're so mad at me, but they're not thinking about you. Yeah, like you don't matter enough to be that person's in their head being like, oh, I'm so mad at Rick. But as a kid, you don't have that perspective. Right. Uh, so 
get, when I got older, it was like, oh, even though I don't love the way that my school system handled me, yeah. I was clear, they didn't know what to do with me. In the public school system, the, the net for what special ed is is so wide. There's, there's just no money, no resources for individual learning. There's things like the Sylvan Learning Center and mm -hmm. some kids go homeschool, like real homeschool, and that helps. But no, the, the, the net is you're, you're in it with everyone. But I want to hear more about that because you, you don't have a GED. No. Uh, you also went to what then? You went to uh, half a semester of middle school once? Half a semester of middle school. Um, just enough time. I like, begged my mom to get out of that class. Like, please. Like, I once I found out what it was. But then why? Uh, because you're teased resent relentlessly. Everyone Did you have friends? Special ed. No. Bef not you. No friends. But but you come out of the class and you know people are doing limp arms and they're they're drooling. It's it's middle school and it's right. brutal. This one I remember people used to do. Yeah. Exactly. So. <laughs> Uh, so the, yeah, it was just like, I hated it. I already was so insecure. Didn't know how to talk to anyone. Uh, my backpack was full of garbage food because we, like food stamps are never enough. So we ate from the garbage. We'd go to like a, the behind the grocery store and take whatever they had that thrown out. So I remember one time I had this giant thing of yogurt that they had slashed because they don't want people picking the trash, just leaking in my backpack. And, you know, it just plays in people's head of like, oh, the, of course, the special wow. ed kid has got yogurt leaking out of his backpack. Did you know, like, you know, a hamster knows its cage and its wheel. Yeah. And then you're introduced to the, did you know that, because you don't watch much television, do you know what this world is, how, how non-typical your lifestyle is? Yes, because we're also being told in the cult that you're special, you're different, you're not like anyone else. We're gonna get saved. Everyone else is uh, is doomed to hell. So you have that, and then you're just a person in the world, and you see, oh, other kids are playing together. They're in, they have friends. You never see kids in school. You don't even see kids out at 10 a.m. because they're in school, and we're always hiding from child services, the government. Anytime anyone knocks on the door, a bus, we're always hiding from people. So yeah, it felt because there's a lot of illegal stuff that's happening. Where has that trauma? Where does that trauma affect you still today that you're aware of? The most detrimental is in a romantic relationship with someone. You like, are in a serious relationship. Yeah, yeah. I've been with my girlfriend for five years now. Today? And yeah, not, yeah today's the anniversary, so she's very mad that I'm here. Um, she goes, go to Santa Monica, nothing but the valley. Just don't go to the valley. So she's pissed. She's like very one of those L.A. T territorial people. L.A.T.P. L.A.T.P. You know, you know, it, you love it. So, no, that's probably the, 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 well, that's what got me out of the cult in the first place, was back at 16, falling in love with a girl, hearing the ideas of what I had about the world, bounced off of a sweet 16-year-old girl, open mind, you're like, well, what, what, no. Um, and uh, Do you have to disassociate from your mom, or is she already away from that? I think from a very young age, disassociated. They, like, when you're, when you, there's no real, like, you, 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 from a very young age, when you realize your parents don't have it, you get disillusioned that like they're in charge, they make the best decision. It happened very young for me. I'm like, other people aren't eating from the trash. Other people don't talk like this. Uh, I'm earning the same amount of money you are, and that's no money. That, yeah, it's always been this essentially business relationship. I mean, we're good now. We're like peers now. Where does she, as where adults. Is she, Where do they live? Uh, she lives up in the in the desert. In she's, California. Yeah, and she's remarried. Have and, they, um, are they proud of you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the fact that I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing my own shit and just... <laughs> right, I know. Eating shit, they're... I mean, if they were to see just this part of the podcast, but you dressed Wait, like yeah. this with, a, with a fake beard and you brought a backdrop, eating, <laughs> like, pretend, like, as yeah. if you're seeing <laughs> goblins that aren't there. <laughs> this is not, this is what people <laughs> expect. What you see now is right. like if someone was raised in extreme poverty in a cult and was indoctrinated, like this is this is what happens. What is, what part of your psychology is these characters and these outrageous things you're playing either a distraction from who you are or uh, uh, finding a way through acceptance, wh whatever that means. What what are you in touch with with that? Uh, there's a couple of things with that. So to finish the thought of like where does it hurt me the most? It's in personal relationships where. I'm, you're really intimate with someone. I can bullshit anyone because we were always scamming people growing up and sneaking in places and, and lying. So 
and my mom is very good at that. She's one of those charming people you ever meet. You got to get her on the pod. She loves me, right? And uh, she's very good at talking to people. So I have that. But then when you take all those barriers down, you're really talking to someone, and they're like, "What? What? What's that shitty thing?" I'm, things are still being unpacked. Where I'm like, "Oh, there's a shitty thing that I do." Can you give me an example reason. of a shitty thing? Um, um, really needing a lot of alone time. Why is that shitty? Um, I don't know, but it's to a point where it, it might actually hurt the other person. It's it's come up multiple times in not just this relationship, but in past relationships where I just like, I just need hours to be alone. And that, I can't explain what I'm doing, but I just, I, I need to recharge. I, I am 100% that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, you and I are not the easiest people to get along with. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's fair. But, but you know, you find your, you, 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 you once we understand, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. Once I understand my boundaries and a way to communicate them clearly, you find someone that is on that frequency or yeah. at least could uh, appreciate it. And, you know, if, it, you know, as someone who has OCD, Betty is unbelievably understanding where somebody else could love me and deal with it. But for whatever reason, it's not, it seems like it's not even difficult for Betty. Yeah. So it works out. Uh, and I've explained to her from the beginning, I use that exact word. I need to, not only do I need to be by myself, it has to be for a couple hours, and it's 100% to recharge. That's it. And that's what we do. And that's the only way I can really create things. Like, I don't, I, I don't write down stand-up. I'm in the apartment, walking around, doing the bit, like a psycho. If I'm doing lines, I can barely read, so the way I memorize things is by saying them out uh -huh. loud, so I need to be saying, ooh, different choices. Well, if there's mi milk today, there won't be tomorrow. No, if there's milk today, Roger, there won't be tomorrow. Um, this is a great script. I'd love to bring it <laughs> in for this. If there's not milk today, Roger. Uh -huh. So it is that. It's part of, like, I need a creative space, but then outside of that, even when I don't have anything to do, uh, I just need that separation. I need a room that is... Not, I couldn't even share a wall with you. I, I feel like I feel like I'm I'm pressing and I am pressing, but that that doesn't that doesn't feel like a, that feels that feels normal to me. Yeah, I think in in is there anything Western else? culture that you start to have the talk when you've been with someone of like what does it look like when we live together when we move in together. Now we're we're looking at a place right now to move in together, but I need like a separate detached garage I could turn into a studio. Like just yep. know that, you know, I I can't be bothered. I just need to recharge there because I think it's the idea that anyone could come in at any moment. That was all I had growing up is in that bus, never having any alone time. Any sibling could roast you for whatever dumb thing you're right. doing. Like in Blindside, when when um when uh they uh, Sandra Bullock gives um. The football player. Are we allowed to say football yes, player? Yes, you're. Yes. The football player. Mm -hmm. uh, and he goes uh, the room, and he goes, "Oh wow, this is amazing." She goes, "You've never had your own room before." And then he says, "I've never had my own bed, bitch." Yeah. And then it's like, oh, so yeah, so you have your own space. That was improv. He did on that. I understand. Bitch. I understand that actually the yeah. line was even correct. I've had a bed, but I've never had my own room. But he, in the moment, said, "Not only have I not had my yeah. own room." Not only have I not had my own bed, you're a bitch. You're a bitch. Yeah. For taking her in. That's a, that's a policy move, you know, and that's how he booked it. He, tell, he went right up to Sandy B. You, you uh, I still... So, yeah, I, I, I don't understand. know how toxic that is, but it is. Uh, it has started fights where she's like, well, I need to see you. I need to be around. I can't feel like I just need to leave the apartment right now. Um, it's exacerbated right now because we're in lockdown. Yes. It wouldn't be when I was on the road yeah. and, you know, but we have a complicated situation where her mom is out here. So her mom is in her apartment. So then we need. How many bedrooms do you have? Uh, it's like a, a, a half of one bedroom. It's a studio that has Oof. like shutters. So, so you no can't space. be alone. There's no door to slam. There's no, I'm, I can freely be me in here. Because it's just the way I create things and the way I, I do things is very weird. It needs to be out loud and I hadn't and planned. I'm not these people that could just like sit. Like if you've, you've done shows with Ron Funches before, the guy is like laying down before the show. Uh, the thing on tour, I was like, I don't know how he does this. And then he goes up there and he crushes. But he's, he's just, he's zen, he's in the moment. I'm jumping around like ta -ta -ta, talking things out like a psycho. I found that, um, that, that nervous, frantic energy I, I want for the opening, but I want it to be controlled and harnessed. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I, 
uh, I either usually play with a Rubik's Cube and or music um, that I could like bob my head to. Uh, it's almost like I'm pressing freeze on that energy and then leaving uh, and then bringing it back on stage. Yeah. But I understand like having that need. Yeah, and you like warm up in my body. I'm not just up there talking. I'm like performing. So it's Do embarrassing. You your- I stretch before stand up. Do you um, tire yourself out? Uh, what? You're, you're big like, energy. Yeah. Yeah, like in the quarantine, because I can't do stand-up and have that, I started uh, surfing because it's a huge time commitment and it's very hard. Or at least I'm not a natural at it and it's exhausting. Cut to a clip. Uh, it's my commercial agent. Take it. Hi, what did we find out? Okay, you booked it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and it's going to be about... Great. Maybe we cut the number. I'll um, buzz everything. We're setting it up in a way, so it most likely will be a, the guarantee is a plus two shoot days. Great. Okay. And then that's the first and the second? Yeah, first and the second. Oh, that's great. Good to meet Yay! Chris. What's his name? Chris Harrison? Chris Harrison. Yeah, Chris Harrison. And then that director is like a big comedy director that I sent you. I don't know if you looked at him. Woody Allen? I need your ring size also. Seven. Uh, I think I'm a seven. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. Congratulations, man. It's an everyday for me. Uh, you, you, every day for what? You then you cut out. It's an everyday for me. So when, we were going to do book, a, You don't have to finish your sentence. Each other's sentences. Ah, you beat me to it. <laughs> there, uh, we were going to do a surfing animation, but instead we're going to uh, we. Bleep, oh, I thought we're out of animation budget. Yeah. Well, not anymore. This we, is we we're over how much budget. You made. But uh, I'll this, give people this a This one episode costs more than the entirety of the six lead series. That was expensive. Very expensive. Yeah, we had uh, extra. Brett Morin's and... fee is incredible. Uh, congratulations, man. What's the commercial? Uh, it's for some internet startup company that uh, they have rings for men. Because, you know, if I'm a man, I'm not going to wear some girly silver. Not that there's anything wrong with girly silver. No, I think it's like... Um, I think it's called Manly Bands, and they have uh, Manly Bands. They have rings with dinosaurs, fla- <laughs> flames, uh, leather. Now rings aren't just for Johnny Depp. Now they can be for the everyday man. And with prices starting at two ninety nine, these rings are affordable. So is the reason your set is it's on a the- pile of trash because of uh, you eating from the trash? Yeah, so I come from the trash and I talk about how... I mean, oh, who gives a shit about giving me the theme, but... Um, Do you not want to talk about it yet? Eh, I don't really care. I mean, like, it's going to be so far from when we shoot it. Um, we, well, I mean, when you it's ready to come out, I'd love to have you back on. We could talk about That'd it then. That'd be great. I essentially come out of the trash pile and, and talk about how stories like mine get elevated in our culture so it makes us feel better about poverty, that anyone could do what I did and, like, pull myself up by the bootstraps yeah. when it's really a lie and... The honest to God truth is that most people are born poor and they die poor. And I'm an outlier and I fought for this. Also got very lucky. There's, there's nothing that makes me more talented and catch Conan's eye than, than anyone else. It's just right time, right place. It's luck mixed with hard work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, those things are very true, maybe even number one and two. But don't discredit the, uh, the talent and ability that you have also because... He has to see you. You have to have that opportunity, but then you, then you, then you do it and you succeed at it. Um, back to what you were saying about you feeling like, uh, you know, do I deserve this or why me or whatever? Yeah. I've had a, a fair amount of people on this podcast who are like, look at their career, and they've. It seems that that's what people think. Yeah, it's the way that this is. But we've seen so many horror stories of people that are at the top and they get brought down. Yeah. It's very unstable and this stuff would make me crazy or even a call like that would I'd be super excited about if uh, before, before I had what I have in my life right now, which is someone that I really love and that's, she's the most important person to me. It's the most important thing to me. That's where I take all my joy and, and pain from and everything else is is really extra from there. So yeah. it's the same thing of like, okay, if you're gonna be like, yay, then your down is gonna be really down. So I, be neutral with it. I had a set uh, in, uh, I was in Florida, and the Friday show, I did very well. And then the Saturday show, I did fine, as I thought, but 
um, the person who has the show asked if they could have the feature headline and have me feature. What? And I said to her... Um, this is recent? This is, no, I mean, no, it was like 2015. Okay, but still, this is not like your first year in comedy. No, but it was my first year or second. Yeah, it was within my first 12 months of going out to headline. And I remember I said to her, which was the truth, um, that makes me feel really bad that that was the impression I've left. But because she said, are you okay with this? She asked me. She didn't command it. Who would be okay with and that? I, I said, yeah. and I don't want that to be the case, but um, it's your club and if that's what you want to do I'll, I will feature and she had me do that hey you know how you're my husband we want you to be one of the kids now <laughs> yeah and I'm gonna fuck the kid <laughs> who by that's the way you, wasn't that funny that's what you're saying you want to fuck a kid yeah I went out to the parking lot I called my dad and I said um I'm feeling insecure and but I am so glad that I only have to do 20 minutes I know how to do 20 minutes yeah and I did great um but uh what was the point I was making what were you we just talking about uh, we were talking about feeling inadequate. We were going back into the, the cult stuff of like, what do I use now for, uh, for that with stand up? I don't know, but I, I, I did bad, I guess. Yeah, uh, that, that is another level of brutal. Like, you were going to demote you on the spot because the, the, the stakes at a comedy club are so low. I remember. It's not art, it's theater. You're, you're, it's, not, it's not theater, you're, you're selling chicken wings. It's like, talk long enough and keep people yeah. entertained so they order wings and two drinks. So uh, I, I wrote down in, in a diary, I guess it would be a diary, but it was like my joke book, you know? Yeah. Um, and Because uh, I felt really good after the first set. And then the next this day is I the felt... the Friday one. The Friday one. Yeah. Then I felt really bad when I got back after the next one. And I wrote down, uh, crushing and bombing have the, same thi- have the same thing in common, which is no matter what the feeling is, it lasts for 48 hours. And yeah. just, you know, when you get that dopamine rush or when you're feeling depressed, it's like there's this Buddhist saying, and I'm paraphrasing, that is, uh, you are the sky. And the sky is always there, but sometimes it's cloudy and sometimes it's not. And when you look up and all you see is the clouds, you have to remind yourself that, like, that's just now. That's not the, the sky is still there. So Nothing like, is permanent. So when you, when, uh, at least, you know, having bad sets or not booking a job stuff that is your livelihood but very superficial at the same time yeah so like when i get really excited about something it's very easy to be like enjoy that take the win yeah um and i'm getting better at when something isn't it's like there will this is this is the cost of the game like this is fixed. Yes, if you want the yes, if you want the, the love and attention that you rarely get, and the things that feeling good. There's so much shit that comes with it. So your stability of your girlfriend, which I can only imagine how powerful stability must feel f- with oh, yeah. where you come from. You need to have a, a, a relationship and to finally be understood. I've been with other people before in in long term relationships, uh, which I say is two years or over. And I've never felt like I could be fully honest with someone like I can with her. To be truly known by someone that you're intimate with is is such a special and such a rare thing that once you get a taste of that, I mean, the fact that honestly that I'm not addicted to meth and didn't do what my siblings did is uh, I've already feel like I made it out. How so, are your siblings now? Good. I mean, everyone is 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 uh, out of rebellion have like overcorrected and become really good parents to their kids. Essentially everyone has kids except me. And they're incredible parents. They just have like regular jobs and um, they've leveled out. But everyone did have their crazy years where they were living on the street, addicted to drugs, some other crimes that- Were you ever doing drugs? Yeah. Yeah, I never got addicted just because I don't have an addictive personality. But every, so that's why I'm like, to no credit of my own. There was no, like, mm-hmm. mm, I overcame it. Um, but, yeah, I've essentially done every drug. But just nothing stuck. Um, you said that the trauma that from what you've come through has, has made it difficult in your uh, intimate relationships. Where could you talk about... That's just where I see it the most. It's not, like, yes, it means challenges, but the, that's, that's where it's the most prevalent. Is there something to you being on stage uh, and being in control that you connect to where you feel like it's uh, some type of therapy for you? It feels like payment. It's more than therapy. It's like payment. There's a reason that I was abused growing up. There was a reason. 
it feels like that. I mean, mm. of course, that's a very fucked up way to frame it. And no one should ever apologize to anyone that, uh, or apologize for someone that abuses a child. But if I can transmute this pain into something that, I mean, fuck the lie that people say, into joy for other people, into a connection for other people, but for actual wealth for myself where I could take care of my family and I actually enjoy doing it, then in a very fucked up way, which is still not healthy, it feels like payment. It feels like it happened for a reason. Now I have the story to tell. Now, you honestly give me an out, and, and if none of that stuff could happen, if I could just be a white guy living in Eugene, Oregon, I would take that in a heartbeat. Are you still hurting so much? Is that why? Or you wouldn't want to have to do it again? I wouldn't. I saw this. I wouldn't want my siblings to go through that pain. I wouldn't want to go through that again. I wouldn't want my parents to have the guilt that they have now for what the, th the things they actually did. Uh, I would wish to take all that away. Uh, that nothing is worth it. Doesn't matter what job you book. I mean, I, I wish I was a lawyer, honestly. Um, but this is the only thing. No, you're out of order. But this is the only thing I can honestly be good at. So it makes me very angry when stand up to be like, this is the only thing I can do. It's like, well, no, you actually could do something else. This is one of the few jobs I could actually do and make money with. Of course, I could work at Taco Bell. Well, even that, they want a GED. But uh, I, could, I could do that job, but this is probably the only thing that I could make money in and, and support myself, and I, I love doing it. And then when I do share things that are fucked up, of like eating from the garbage or having to go to a, a cheer camp or everyone thought I was a girl at 13, uh, and, I sh and then people connect, come up to me after and they'll connect with that, that feels a little bit better. You feel less alone. You feel less crazy. Um, or you can write something that, that makes people feel something. It, I don't know, brings validation to the pain. Is there, is but it's not healthy, and I hate the thing that's perpetuated what's in stand-up. What's not healthy? It's that what the people uh, perpetuate that you need to be in pain to do stand-up. You need this fucked up past. Everyone needs to be Mark Maron, thinky pain. It's like, well, how do you feel about the idea of that? Forget the idea that people are saying that they need this, but the truth, which I, I, I want to say, I believe, but it's, I know, but yeah. I guess I, be, at least I believe that those things can still be harnessed and used for. They can be used for good, but more often than not, they are not. They are used to perpetuate patterns of abuse. Right. They are used to, uh, you know, they kill people. People get addicted to drugs. They can't cope, you know, exacerbates the poverty situation that we have in America. So it's a very small number. And I think by making poverty a psychological issue versus a systemic issue mm -hmm. and perpetuating the lie that every homeless person you step over on Ventura could just pull themselves up by the bootstraps is very harmful and it's yeah. comforting. This is why I have a career because it's comforting for people to watch a, a poor person be on Conan to be like, ah, oh, they did it. Everyone right. could make it out. Right. I mean, it, it is a lie. Yeah. Do you have a certain a type of empathy toward homeless people in particular Yeah. because of that? Yeah. Were you? Do you consider yourself to have been homeless? Because you yeah. were living in a bus, right? Yeah, we lived in a bus, and then we lived in a uh, windowless garage with no running water um, that we were also hiding in because it was a, <laughs> there was other people in the actual house part. Um, yeah, and then always getting evicted from places. On top of everything else, my mom is a hoarder, so the houses are packed with not only junk but roaches and mice, and it's just it's it's hell and yeah i mean it's i don't know i'm aware of how ignorant what i'm saying sounds uh and i am both i guess what i'm, I'm pre pre prefacing with uh my as a 36 year old now understanding things being bigger than they are but also still an emotional judgment that yeah. that i have as a human there's this part of me that feels like wow i'm so surprised to find out that that's your background as if I know what that does to somebody. So I don't, and I'm aware of that, but like in it a is, very it, I do get that often way. where people are, yes, I do think I could, ha I could be a little bit more Shia LaBeouf and get away with it. You couldn't be dressed more like a cartoon homeless person. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This if, also this like, do, this looks like uh, an adaptation when they tried to make him a different twin brother and it was like shitty makeup of Nicolas Cage. I believe you, but I don't know the reference and I don't want to get caught in something. Yeah, okay, but it just... <laughs> 
I look like the guy in uh, Team America World Police when he's not doing well. The main guy when he's it's all his lost moment and he's throwing up. I believe you. I remember the America fuck yeah, <sighs> but uh, we'll put up pictures. We'll put up pictures. The people right. at home will get it. Yeah, it, it is. I, I, to no credit of my own, and that's not this thing of like, look how humble I am. There are clear moments when I could have made a terrible decision, could have addicted to drugs, could have recreated patterns of abuse, and just have it. I, I, that's why I, I really believe in the chemical makeup of someone's brain. Yeah. I think Andrea Yates gets the same information that my mom got, and hers, because of the chemicals in her brain, caused her to kill her kids. She got the same information from the same cult leader, had the same age kids. Everything, is, chemicals is a huge thing. Um, it's the clouds in the sky, it's the, it's the depression, yeah. it's the compulsion, uh, it's a big makeup. But there, you are a being of somebody who is making their own choices. Some are more challenging than others, some are more influenced than others, and some don't have to be in the position to make certain choices. Uh, and it's very nice how, how fair you are to the reality and not just to what you've done, but you've made your decisions. And it does seem like, I, you call it unhealthy, and I, it seemed to me your explanation of the past you came from and are you using it as, as payment, it sounds to me another way of referring to that is you just having gratitude and acceptance of where you come from. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm floored. Yeah, by I'm the just story saying like it makes me. me it just makes me angry when people are like you're oh but you're lucky that that happened to you, and if you actually live through it, no, right. you're not lucky even if you have. A, a, a movie career. So you're saying somebody who is not in this business or hasn't had work to be like, man, I would have lived on a bus until I was A general meeting. Whatever. Yeah, a general meeting. Oh, I bet you are thanking your parents right. now. Crazy when you're growing up. And it's like, no. I mean, it, it, was, it was scary. Mm. I was scared all the time. I was scared of my parents. I was scared that we were not going to make it, not going to survive. And it's fear that I carry over today. I mean, I haven't spent any of my sitcom money. Just because I was always planning for a rainy day, uh -huh. which is very weird that, that 2020 has validated everything because it's like, oh, fuck. I mean, it just validated that what I, what I thought was at least a rational fear that this could all go away at any moment. Yeah. You know? Um, Moses, what a fun opportunity that I had to do some bits with you but have this conversation. Yeah. I, uh, I feel quite emotional at the moment. It's, a, it's, it's what goofy bitches do, mm -hmm. right? To get that moment. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question for you, is how are you feeling uh, not being on stage? I notice there's a real change in my body and the way I sleep and the way I interact with people when you're not getting that attention or just that very weird thing to go up in front of a group of strangers and try to make them laugh if you get accepted or even not, even just that, those nerves before. There was a, uh, uh, I started this podcast before all this happened. And I'm still figuring out and growing and learning this, this, this medium. But it went from me doing the podcast and kind of obsessing on it because at the time, I, other than stand-up, which is realistically three to four nights a week, yeah. uh, I'm doing, building this, right? Stand-up goes away and I dive deeper into the podcast, both because it's growing organically and, and second because I, I'm looking for that outlet. Yeah. And uh, my girlfriend, who just got into the country a couple of days ago, her arms are exhausted. I don't want to get into it right now. <laughs> but she is producing this podcast we've been helping. So I started this long-distance relationship. I'm now six months away from my girl where we aren't just catching up. We actually are working on something together. So not only is it bonding, it feels like we're growing something. And it is not the same art form by any means podcasting from stand-up right. it does have a very 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 small thing in common which is comedy for whatever that means comedy talking i get a little bit with our digital show but yeah but it, ha it has given me and i'm very grateful for it and i complain about it all the time on this podcast of how much work it is but i'm very grateful for not only the distraction the outlet and it doesn't have that same thing where i could I don't want to say trick the audience, but, yeah. but uh, manipulate an energy and play in that, Absolutely. which I miss so much. But there are ways of doing it on here, whether it's telling my guests, hey, this is the Halloween episode, and then just yeah. having something to play with. And then they get here and they one-up it for, against me. And it's, and it's now 
we're doing it together or we could be doing it against them or I could be doing it for with them against you or you you know there's yeah there's it is the sense of community that you get because you're talking to comedians and that's a big part of what we miss too is you're seeing all your friends that you don't make plans with you just see them backstage and you have these random nights because you're running around to different clubs different spots when I'm with, at a club and again I, I want to speak for us I'll speak for me tell me where yeah. you connect even backstage, I'm still at the club. I'm out. Oh, yeah. I'm on. Yeah. I know I have, a, I would say, a perception, but a, a more negative, realistic term is a reputation of just being annoying, an intellectual bitch, or just a bitch, yeah. a, bit, uh, a bit bitch. Uh, but I've had this opportunity to have people on this podcast for one to two hours, some of which I've never had this dynamic with, some of which I, we've never even met. We just know of each other a yeah. little. It's nice to feel a validation that, oh, I'm allowed to not be special. You know, yeah. I'm allowed to just, I'm supposed to right. do this. So because of the podcast, it is, I don't leave the house much. I've been able to talk to people. Um, this one in particular, there have been some where you and I have so much in common as needs of a performer, yeah. but don't know each other that well. And to be able to have this, um, it's a corny term that I used before, but I feel it's corny on me. Uh, I feel grateful. And like, I mean, this has been so nice. And so, I mean, your story is uh, incredible. Um, no, I could definitely reciprocate that and tell you I feel the exact same way. A lot of what I miss about performing is exactly what, what you've provided for me today. And I hated connection. you when I met you in Arizona. I know you really went after me. I need to make sure this is clear that I'm 100% joking. And <laughs> yeah, I, I never had a negative thought Just because I was spiraling because of my own insecurities at that show. Um, it, well, where could, people, uh, where could people see you? I'll put, obviously, your Instagram and Everything stuff up, but is, still say Everything is, it. yeah, at Moses Storm, so um, I across Twitter, Instagram. Is there an easy place where people could check out stand-up? Because a lot of people who watch this love stand-up. Oh, I think if you just search Moses Storm, I think the Conan sets come up first, and then um, Comedy Central Presents, or whatever that one is, is the one that we were talking about earlier. So I'll look Moses for specific Storm. links, too. Look in the description. Uh, I'll put your Instagram and Twitter yeah. and, and links to it. And then there's a new show I'm on on Freeform, called Cal Penn Approves This Message. It's sort of a positive daily show is their pitch. Is it out? And uh, yeah, it just premiered this week. I think it's Wednesdays at uh, 10.30. I'm just a correspondent, but it's Cal's show. But it's it's essentially voting information for people. Well, um, I guess to my audience, two things to say. First, uh, happy Halloween. And uh, second, I want to start, uh, I'm very interactive on my Patreon. And uh, I've recently started pushing it a little bit more. And I want to do a Patreon exclusive thing with you where uh, because stand up hasn't been happening for us, I would love for you to do, I don't know, 10 minutes of stand up for me. Wow. It could be five. It could be five. It could be none. Um, well, we'll see. We'll have to figure it out. But if you want to see the continuation, head on over to patreon.com slash take your shoes off. No obligation, though. That's only if you really want to see some more. But we'll be doing some stand up. My name's Rick Glassman and Scoot too. Bubbity Blue. Music is coming in. We can cut to you. You're eating some shit. Uh huh. Great. Uh, now for the continuation of the Patreon here. Hey everybody. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs>